Is your, um, are you getting sound on yours? I'm not getting sound. So good afternoon. I'm Andy Rich. I'm Dean of the Colin Powell School here at City College, which is our School of Social Sciences. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this, our third annual Stanley Feingold Lecture on American Politics. Today, America at a crossroads. The post-election discussion with Congressperson Karen Bass, who represents California's 37th Congress. Uh, your, your, your speech is, it's all ready. Yeah, we just need to ask people to mute as you come in, if you don't mind. And that will, I think, avoid the, uh, the reverberation. Okay, now I think I, you can hear me more clearly. So we're joined today by Congressperson Karen Bass. She represents California's 37th Congressional District and by Congressperson Jamie Raskin, who represents Maryland's 8th District. Both of them won re-election by overwhelming margins last week, and both are leaders in the House of Representatives. We're thrilled to have them with us this week to talk about the elections and their implications for governing, for public policy, and for mm. democracy. We all just lived through one of the most unusual election seasons in modern history. We're in the midst of a national pandemic, climate catastrophes, a rush, a completely partisan Supreme Court confirmation, and the biggest movement for racial justice in the nation's history. The current and now defeated occupants of the White House had COVID, but denies its severity and the growing rates of infection across the country. The challenger did relatively few public events as his likability numbers climbed. President-elect Biden won with the most votes ever in a presidential election. And news of his victory set off unprecedented street celebrations across the country, including in many of the neighborhoods here of New York City. But his opponent has not conceded, and Republican Senate and House leaders have not acknowledged the president's victory, the president-elect's victory, either. Democrats have lost seats in the House, and control of the Senate is not yet resolved. It has been quite an election season. So this is a good moment to take stock and to consider the implications of the results for the year ahead. This conversation, this event, is made possible by a group of City College alums, many of whom are with us today, who care deeply about American politics. And part of their passion for American politics is rooted in perhaps the one thing they have in common. All of them had Stanley Feingold as a professor. Professor Feingold was a beloved and gifted professor of political science who taught at City College for almost four decades. He wrote about American politics, he taught about American politics, and he ignited a passion among his students over many generations to be active in the political process to wonder about our political system and to be forces for good in it. This annual lecture stems from that passion and these alums came together some years ago to launch the event as a way to interrogate big ongoing questions about American politics and to do it as a way to celebrate and to honor Professor Feingold. I did not have the privilege of knowing Professor Feingold personally, but I feel like I did from the many stories of his students. And representing this group of alums, I wanna introduce Anita Alt a 1967 graduate of City College and one of the leaders who makes this lecture possible, Anita. And Anita, you're, you're muted. I wanna welcome you here today as well to this, our third annual Stanley Feingold Memorial Sym Symposium and to give a particular warm welcome to Stanley Feingold's family, most especially to Fumiko, his wonderful wife who are joining us from the West Coast. The, this lecture series, as, as you've just heard, was established by a, a large group of alumni in partnership with the City College's Colin Powell School to both honor the memory of Stan, to, to honor the memory of Stanley, a beloved gifted professor of political science. He was also a graduate of City and taught here for almost four decades. For the generations of those of us fortunate to have been his students, he left a lasting, often life-changing mark as expressed in the many tributes from his former students that flowed following his death in September, 2017. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's often said that if you majored in political science during his long tenure here, most likely you majored in Stanley Feingold. Professor Feingold was a passionate, dedicated teacher committed to his students. He intellectually challenged us, provoking us with hard, often uncomfortable questions, forcing us to see other sides of our long held, one might say smugly held views. In class, he never revealed his position. 
He and Professor George McKenna, who also had a long career at the college, together published the book, Taking Sides, Clashing Views on Controversial Political Issues, which provided read readers with an opportunity to do the same. His commitment was to help develop critical thinkers, a capacity so desperately needed in contemporary America. He was also so committed to this college. When City College was closed during the student strike in 1968, Stanley opened his home, then located nearby to the school to conduct his classes. Trusted by students and the administration alike, he was called in to help negotiate a resolution to the shutdown. Years after he retired, for almost two decades, he would travel from Seattle, Washington, five times a year to meet with former students, as you've just heard, who were now long established in their own careers. And this gathering was really to continue and to recapture the scintillating, challenging discussions over paper bag, because uh, I joined when we weren't in a restaurant, they were already removed to the to offices. Um, challenging discussions over brown bag lunches about the current state of the American political landscape. Landscape. You can only imagine what fodder the 2016 election of Trump provided for us and how we, he would have had so much to say about last week's election. And it was only then at these lunchtime discussions that we learned his true political opinions, passionately felt, but for all those years in the cl classroom, carefully restrained from sharing. Moreover, he continued to write and we were blessed to receive his many opinion pieces. Over time, he wrote a significant body of essays which revealed his humanist progressive perspective that challenged many conventional wisdoms. These writings have been comp compiled by my fellow alumni and a PDF has been made available and can be downloaded from the college's events page and also was included with the email reminder of this event that went out this morning. Finally, on behalf of my fellow alums, I want to express our profound appreciation for the enthusiastic support of President Boudreaux, D.D. Mozaleski, the Executive Director of the Combined Foundations at the college, and Dean Andrew Rice and Abigail Fetter Kane of the Colin Powell School, who have made it possible for us to honor our beloved teacher with this founding of the annual Stanley Feingold Lecture Series. This program, could not have come at a more propitious time in our country's history. This event was planned months ago to discuss and dissect the results of last week's presidential election and its likely impact on the course of our nation over the next four years. I can think of no better time to have this discussion of an America so divided and at a real crossroad. We are so grateful to both of you, Representatives Raskin and Bass, who have given us their precious time during this fraught post-election period. And of course, to Aaron Lewis, highly respected political anchor of New York One. As I have said before, the pity is that Stanley is not able to participate in what I know will be a fascinating session and to receive this honor at this institution he so dearly loves. Thank you so much. Anita, thank you very much. And thank you again to the whole Feingold, Feingold Lecture Committee. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Vince Boudreaux, the president of City College, former dean of the Colin Powell School, and perhaps most importantly today, he is a political scientist by training, President Boudreaux. You know, it's funny when you say that. Um, my political science expertise is on uh, transitions to democracy, uh, social movements, and authoritarianism in Southeast Asia. And, and I've been over the last couple of months prodded by some of my colleagues to use some of that expertise to, to talk and think about uh, American politics. And it's a sad moment that, that, that my background and knowledge would in any way be relevant to an American, um, to an American election or, or a transition between governments in this country. I will, however, leave most of the political science today to, to our, our representatives and, and, and the experts on the panel. This is an extraordinary panel um, taking place at an extraordinary moment in, in our history. Um, I, did, I did know Stanley Feingold. I knew Stanley as a, as a young political scientist in the early 1990s when every spring after finals had been over and things had settled down, 
there was always a huge commotion in the conference room of the political science department when when Stanley and George McKenna um, from the left and the right would would marshal their arguments um, and put together their their the latest edition of, of, of taking sides and and boy I sure tried to tiptoe past that doorway every day because if 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 they principally Stanley if Stanley heard somebody outside he'd say who's out there come in here a second I got I got we have some questions for you and like it or not, prepared or not, you were um, a participant in a debate that you didn't really even know the rules for. Um, and, and, and that legacy is, is how he taught. It's, it's the seriousness with which he regarded the opinions of his students. And, and you see it in the resilience of the, the bonds that he created uh, among these students. This event is, I, I think we're in the third or fourth year of, of this event, and it, it is truly a testament, not just to Stanley and, and his relationship with his students, although it is largely that, but also it's a testament to what City College should be doing at its very, very best. We are um, at the very top of, of the national rankings in colleges that, that, that produce social mobility among our students by by some calculations, second nationally only to Baruch College, which some of you knew as City College downtown when you were uh, CCNY students. Um, and so here we have a group of alumni who certainly came to City College back in the day, no better provisioned, no wealthier um, than the students of today, and, and came to this place and worked with our faculty, worked with Stanley, and are now in a position every single year to use their judgment and their connections and their positioning in American society, a positioning that surely traces back to their decision to come to this institution, to convene and bring together by dint of their insight and, and standing, some of the most uh, exciting, relevant uh, <laughs> conversations that we ever had on campus about politics. This is, this is a moment every year where we have the um, Stanley Feingold students, a, a group that I was taught in the early 90s to call the Bull and Biddles Club. I don't know that you go by that anymore. Um, where you do us the great favor of, 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 of convening extraordinary conversation. Um, I've always been uh, insistent that City College be driven to fully enact its public responsibility. We are a public college, I've always thought, not just because we're supported by the taxpayers of New York State, but because we have an obligation in exchange for that and as a way of meeting our historic charge to educate the whole people. We have an obligation to make the resources of the public university publicly available. And so in this moment, when we face so much uncertainty, um, to have the benefit of your judgment, to pull together this conversation, to help us figure out where we stand and think about where we might be going and, and, and maybe even imagine what each one of us needs to do to get there is, is a real gift. And, and so I'm, 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 I'm grateful to each and every one of you that have, that have pulled this together I'm so excited to hear our, our speakers address the subject um, and so happy to welcome this audience to uh, the very first virtual installation of the Stanley Flying Bowl lecture. So thank you. President Boudreau, thank you <clears throat> very much. Um, and it's, it's now my privilege to introduce Errol Lewis, our moderator for today's discussion. Errol Lewis is the political anchor of Spectrum News NY1, where he hosts Inside City Hall, a nighttime prime, primetime show that focuses on New York politics. He's everyone's source on politics in this city. He's also a member of the adjunct faculty of the Urban Reporting Program at the City University of New York's Graduate School of Journalism. So very glad he is a part of CUNY too. Um, Mr. Lewis is going to lead a discussion with our guest today. We will have time toward the end for a Q&A. And I want to encourage you, the way we'll do it is through questions in the chat. So please make use of the chat during the course of today's event. My colleague, Debbie Chang, who's our Director of Fellowships and Public Service Partnerships will assist 
Mr. Lewis with the questions and she'll be pulling your questions from the chat. Um, two last notes, we are recording the conversation for those who can't be with us right now. And we have muted everyone and asked that you stay muted so that we can hear. Um, with that, let me turn it over to Mr. Lewis. Thank you again very much for being with us. Today. Okay, thank you very much, Dean Rich. And I'm very glad to be here. I did not know uh, Professor Steingold, but, uh, Feingold, but um, I feel like um, we are kindred spirits. You say he was into hard questions and deep discussions and uh, being fair. And that is, of course, what we try and do in journalism every day. Let me just introduce our guests and then I want to start with some questions and we'll get right into it. Congress member Karen Bass was reelected to her fifth term representing the 37th Congressional District in November 2018. She serves on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs where she chairs the Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights and International Organizations. She is a member of the House Judiciary Committee and chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congressman Jamie Raskin is completing his second term representing the 8th Congressional District in Maryland. He's a member of the House Judiciary Committee as well, where he's vice chair of the Subcommittee on the Constitution. He's also a member of the Committee on Oversight and Reform, the Committee on House Administration, and the House Committee on Rules. So uh, welcome, members, and thank you for uh, spending some time with us. I want to um, start by asking, it, it's fair to say that this election, in some sense, was a split decision by voters who uh, clearly wanted the removal of President Trump. On the other hand, Democrats also lost several seats in the House. Uh, I know all of the numbers are not in yet, but that's how it appears at this point. Uh, the Democrats did not win control of the Senate, as many had hoped, and did not flip any of the state houses. So were voters saying that they reject President Trump, but not the party that he leads? Let me start with uh, Congress Member Bass. First of all, thank you. Thank you for having me here. I'm honored to be a part of this and it was wonderful to, to uh, learn about Professor Feingold. And let me also just say that I am so honored to uh, serve with Representative Raskin. He is one of, well, one, he's a constitutional scholar, but uh, everybody loves when he gets up and speaks because we know we're gonna learn a lot in, in whatever he has to say. You know, I mean, I think that uh, now is the time for us to definitely do the analysis, but I do think that we have to do the deep analysis of the voters too. And I think that some of that isn't back. And so I don't know that I would say that it's because they accept his party. What I do believe is absolutely the case is a rejection of him and his leadership and how he has led over these last four years. But I also believe when the analysis is done, I will not be surprised to learn that COVID, the pandemic, the fact that we have lost 230 plus thousand Americans was also one of the leading issues as to why people voted the way they did. One of the mysteries for me is voters not connecting the pandemic to the economy. And so voters feeling as though he mismanaged the pandemic, but they trust him on the economy without you know, seeing the connection. It just shows the work that we have to do. Mm. Congressman, what's your take on it? Um, well, Errol, first of all, thank you for having me. And I want to um, uh, add my thanks to that of uh, Congresswoman Bass for um, the invitation to come. Thank you, President Boudreau. Thank you, Dean Rich. And thank you, Anita Altman. And thanks to the Feingold family uh, for having us. And I am uh, also honored to be with my beloved colleague, uh, Karen Bass, who's been such a, an amazing legislative force in the Congress. And you know, she brought us together to pass what I think may be the single most important bill we passed in the 116th Congress, which is the, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Um, but in answer to your question, um, I, I think the first half of it, you got totally right, which is I think there really is a nationwide mandate uh, of repudiation of not just Trump, but Trumpism, because I think they are closely linked together in the public mind. And that's going to be by we don't know yet exactly how many, but something like six or seven million votes. I mean, we're talking about a resounding, decisive majority repudiation of Trumpism and endorsement of a, uh, of a progressive center uh, strategy to get the country moving again. Um, but when you say um, that the country is also, well, I think you said hey, we rejected Trump but not Trumpism, I don't see it that way because what you're talking about, at least on the House side, is a handful of seats. I think we're talking about six or seven seats, and it's a tragedy that we lost 
uh, a number of our colleagues, Debbie Murkowski Powell and uh, Donna Shalala, and you know a bunch of our close friends we lost. But remember, in um, 2018, we won 43 seats when we took the House back 235 to 200. That was a landslide sweep. And we took something like, I think, 29 or 30, Karen might have the exact number, um, but around 30 seats that were in Trump districts. Trump was not on the ballot in 2018. Trump was on the ballot, of course, in 2020. So all of his people came out and everybody was saying, well, why is he continually going back to the his red base with the red meat in the last couple of months? Well, it was a smart strategy because he basically got out every single red meat supporter. It wasn't enough in the presidential because there are millions more people who support a democratic direction instead. But it was enough to swamp a number of our colleagues that were caught in Trump districts with that kind of mobilization of his vote. But you know, I don't mean to deny that there aren't serious political cleavages in the country, because obviously there are. But if you're just looking at majorities and minorities, Hillary beat him by more than 3 million votes last time. We beat him by double that number of votes this time, by like six or seven million. And uh, it is a matter of uh, bewilderment and astonishment to me that 70 million people could be voting for this guy after his lethal recklessness and incompetence in managing COVID-19 alone without even talking about separating parents and children at the border or the demolition of the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act uh, rules or withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord or what have you. But just looking alone at COVID-19 and conducting these super spreader events at the White House and having COVID-19 ravage the White House staff and the cabinet every day, another one comes down with the disease. It's, it's a, a matter of um, just astonishment that so many people could vote for him. But this is where we are. And I think it speaks a lot to the nature of the social media and the development of a uh, propaganda system that has succeeded really in um, brainwashing or at least impairing the judgment of millions and millions of our countrymen and countrywomen. And I say that not as a matter of moral judgment, but as a statement of fact and real fear about where we're going. Let me um, pick up on, on, on that and talk a little bit about um, the cities and the suburbs. Uh, suburbs, I grew up in New Rochelle, just north of, uh, of where we are here in the city. They're a lot more um, diverse than Trump seemed to realize, but he pretty overtly campaigned on a strategy of saving the suburbs. D did that work for him? I haven't looked at all of the numbers in, uh, in all of the, the key states, but he sure seemed to lean, on, lean in on that as a strategy. What do you think, Congressman? No, well, I'll tell you about my district, uh, which is uh, Montgomery County, Frederick County, Carroll County, Maryland. So it's basically a mixture of suburban and rural areas. Um, and I think it reflects the national pattern. I mean, the suburbs moved significantly um, further in a democratic direction, uh, went bluer. And of course, it was suburban women that led the way there. I mean, think about, you know, who's been running all of these great uh, indivisible organizations and do the most good. And, you know, when I look at my district, it's women who are running them. And these, these organizers have been the backbone of the resistance. However, in my rural areas, and I've got um, the most rural county in Maryland, which is also the reddest county, um, there was huge turnout. Um, my vote actually went up a little bit, but Trump's vote went way up. Um, and I think that has been the national pattern. There has been this tremendous ideological polarization. Um, and you know, to me, the single most trenchant answer to Trumpism has been Black Lives Matter because uh, it put on the table really what is underlying all of it. And um, you know, they've found the deep state and the deep state is not at the State Department and it's not uh, at the Treasury Department. The deep state is racism and white supremacy. That is the deep structure of the country that still needs to be uprooted and transformed. And that's why I'm glad that we're gonna be, let's hope off the path of a failed state, a state that cannot deliver the basic goods of existence to its people and on the path towards democratic reconstruction, interracial progress for social change. The only thing that has ever worked for us in terms of moving forward in American history. 
And uh, Con Congress Member Bass, there are a number of members of your caucus. I've been fascinated by, in particular, after the results of the 2018 election, um, who are not what I would call sort of traditional CBC members, right? I'm used to seeing members like, you know, uh, Charlie Rangel from Harlem, who is one of the co-founders of, of the caucus, who are from overwhelmingly Black districts. You have a number of members who are from not just minority, but like thin minority, just, you know, 3%, 4% Black, and they have a Black representative. Uh, that suggests some changes going on in the country as well. Well, let me just also respond to the last question, because I think that we all know that the word uh, suburbs and suburban was a euphemism. I mean, you know, his campaign strategy was to resurrect George Wallace and Joe McCarthy. And so that was just a, and, and I think that um, Representative Raskin, you know, summed it up well. But I, but I think that what he didn't realize, because that's really not what he was getting at, is that the suburbs have changed. The suburbs are more diverse. But he didn't really, he wasn't really talking about the suburbs. He was just using that to reference to white folks. And then in terms of the Congressional Black Caucus, just a few uh, data points for folks, is that we have 54 members because we lost uh, Mr. Lewis. Uh, we, we believe that we will be around 60 members uh, by January in terms of our members uh, that, that have won. And you should know that with, I don't know, maybe four or five exceptions, all of us, every single one of us represents very diverse districts. My district is 30% Black, 30% Jewish, 30% Latino, 10% Asian. What I think you might be referring to is that we have five members uh, that represent the Black population is under 5%. And so their districts are majority white. And needless to say, the day after the election in 2018, they received a, a pretty severe backlash. However, we, uh, they were all reelected. We have one person who the votes are still being counted. It's been going back and forth, Lauren Underwood. But I think what it shows, which has been known for a very, very long time, that it's a stereotype of a black elected official that the only people that will vote for us are black people. That's just not the case, you know, AKA our former president. But, uh, but I think that it's very important to dispel the myth that it's not just black people that vote for black folks. As a matter of fact, the member of Congress that has the highest concentration of black voters a black constituents is Steve Cohen, uh, who um, I assume you know is not African American. <laughs> right in Memphis, right. Very interesting. <laughs> and and Congress member, there's. Uh, I want to jump into this national conversation about whether moderate members um, lost this time because they were seen as championing socialism or defunding the police. These kind of wedge issues that turned off voters in some districts. As far as you're concerned, first of all, is that true? And, and if not, what led to the loss of, of uh, the half dozen or so seats? Well, I, well, number one, I think we need to take each race separately. We need to do the deep dive and that analysis has not occurred yet. Uh, I do think that there are some trends. I know what my colleagues were reacting to is how they were hit, the commercials that were done. And so we need to see exactly what the impact was in each of the districts that we lost. Now, one thing I don't want to see is I don't want to see Democrats then circling the wagons and firing on each other. We need to, if that's the case, if it was socialism, if it was defund the police, and none of those candidates ran on that, then we need to figure out how to beat back that message as opposed to fire on each other. Mm. Congressman, what do you think? Well, I agree completely with Karen about this. The, the first thing you got to know is um, the Republicans will call anything we do socialist. They call Social Security socialist. They call Medicare socialist. They call public education socialist. They call the Affordable Care Act socialist. And they call pre-existing condition coverage socialist before they realized that it was overwhelmingly popular in the public. And then they said that the, they were going to defend in their own plan, which they've never produced. Um, but so, so that's one thing. So you got to take it with a grain of salt. And we know that, the, you know, they want to try to exacerbate conflict within the Democratic caucus after we've come through a period of, you know, almost a year of like complete unity and focus that's been quite remarkable. Um, I, I will say that um, I, I think that there's a, there's a, a serious debate, one befitting CCNY, um, uh, that the left should have about socialism 
uh, as a language, just as a, as a term for describing what people are fighting for. That, you know, that goes, um, that goes beyond the semantic. You know, I, I had always wished that uh, Elizabeth Warren had challenged Bernie to a debate about progressive liberalism versus socialism to talk about, you know, what really is the American tradition. And, you know, if the people are calling themselves socialists, I'm very curious to know, do they believe in dialectical materialism? Do they think that socialism is going <laughs> to replace capitalism? Because in my lifetime, it's been the reverse. Capitalism has been replacing socialism, you know, and um, do they believe in state control of all private property and the means of production? I don't think so. I think when I talk to AOC and, you know, the other younger people who call themselves so socialists, they're really talking about national health care. Well, Maggie Thatcher presided over a national health care system in the United Kingdom when she was, you know, the right wing prime minister. So, you know, my advice to the young people is I don't think you need to buy yourself all of the problems of, you know, a predatory right wing by calling yourself that. I understand that people may have reasons for it. And I think we should have that discussion. But um, in any event, Karen's right. I mean, the, the right wing is going to say what they will. We've got to maintain uh, our unity, our solidarity as the caucus and keep the great engine of democratic interracial progress going in the country. That's our assignment. So I've been using the language of uh, of a new reconstruction, a third reconstruction, or uh, a new New Deal um, in America. And I've also been saying that, you know, my opponent, uh, uh, when we had debates in our debate, he said, I belong to a pro-communist party, the first words out of his mouth. <laughs> so I understand what was happening to, you know, uh, Donna Shalala and our friend, Debbie Mercasel Powell and our friends in Florida today, because he was doing the same thing to me. But when he said, you belong to a pro-communist party, I said, that's interesting. Because your president's role model is Vladimir Putin, the former head of the KGB, and he loves President Xi, whose performance on coronavirus, he's praised 37 times the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, and he's in love, literally in love with the North Korean communist dictator. So you belong to a pro-communist party. My party's on the side of democracy and freedom. That's what I'm fighting for. And more seriously, I said, you call me a liberal, I am a liberal, because the heart of that word is liberty, and if we're not for liberty, what are we for? You call me a progressive. I am a progressive because the heart of that word is progress. If we're not fighting for progress, what are we doing in politics? But then I really stuck to this guy. I said, you know what? My favorite thing to call myself these days is a conservative because I want to conserve the land, the air, the water, the climate system, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, everything you guys want to destroy is what we're trying to conserve in America. And the only thing they want to conserve these days is their own wealth and power. And that's not even enough to justify the use of the word conservatism, which has a little bit more honor and integrity in it than that. So forgive me for rambling a little bit, but I, I mean, I'm sick of the name calling that we've got to deal with. We've got a real program for America. Well, let me um, ask you, uh, Congressmember Member Bass, um, I've looked at some polling data that is suggesting that the, um, the high tide of uh, broad public support for activism around issues of racism and policing in particular has um, changed or cooled off a little bit, if you want to put it that way smaller numbers now supporting uh, the movement. Um, have you perceived any of that? And what are the prospects for reform in the next Congress? And, uh, and why would we be surprised about that? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I mean, I think a few things. Uh, number one, I was so, so uh, excited to see the movement happen because it was the mass movement on the streets that provided the political will for us to be able to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And what the bill actually is, is a compilation of uh, several pieces of legislation that members of the Black Caucus had been fighting for, for many, many years, but it took the mass response, not just in every state in our country, but around the world for us to pass that legislation. But I think what we have seen since George Floyd's torture and murder is a number of people killed since then. And you see numerous protests. Now, I've been very concerned about the protests, very, very supportive of the peaceful protests, but when those protests turn violent, we need to be very clear about who is actually committing the violence. And frankly, in some of the areas, 
I've really worried that the African American residents in those areas like Portland, for example, are suffering the consequences of a number of folks going out and protesting who are actually not African American, protesting in solidarity, but yet when it comes down to it, uh, I believe there's retribution to black folks that live in the area and it's assumed that it's black people creating the violence. I know you, you heard about the murder that took place in Oakland that was associated with the protest there. Later it was found that it was a man from a white supremacist organization who infiltrated the protests and uh, um, carried out the murder right there so it would make it look like it was a part of the protest. I'm sure you saw the protests that happened uh, in Milwaukee where there was a white supremacist who covered himself up completely and was walking down the street smashing the windows. And then you have that right before the campaign and um, Representative Raskin and I had to sit through a judiciary hearing that infuriated both of us where what our Republican colleagues did for 10 minutes was played news coverage of riots. And so as long as you had that narrative out there that people who are fighting for racial justice are actually trying to take something away from you and destroy your cities, then I think that has absolutely impacted the view of the protest. But in our country, we have historically done that. Uh, what motivated me and, and continues to is that this time the protests and the killing actually led to people in our country raising the issue of systemic racism. I, in all the years I have been working on this issue, and it's been several decades now, it was the first time I saw people actually accepting that there was a problem in our country. Prior to George Floyd, every time there was a murder on video, they would interview people and you would have black folks that say there is a systemic problem, white folks who say it was just one incident. This was the first time that 70% of all people said there was actually a structural problem here. Now, I know some of that 70% has eroded, and I am very hopeful with a new administration and removing a person who is a white supremacist in the White House out of the scene that maybe we will be able to heal this country, especially with President-elect Biden coming in and saying that racial justice is gonna be one of the issues that he wants to address that we can get back to the issue. Mm. One um, related issue to that uh, Congress member, and I know uh, I didn't put it in your extensive uh, biography, I, I couldn't include it, um, but you have a long uh, history in activism, community activism and civil rights. And something new that I've noticed at least since Occupy Wall Street is that uh, today's activists don't uh, act the way or don't perform or execute the way their uh, ancestors did, meaning uh, it's hard to find uh, an organized group. They don't necessarily have a list of right. demands. Right. They don't necessarily um, have the, the kind of structure where there's a clear distinction between who's in the march and who's not in the march exactly. or who even called the march. And that, that too leads to, to some problems of the kind you're describing, right? Well, yeah, in the past, we worried about what we called agent provocateurs. I mean, we would have protests here in Los Angeles because we had a particularly crazy police chief. And, you know, there'd be a thousand people at the protests and probably 50 undercover officers. So this time you don't really need to do that because you can do it through social media frankly, and we know because we learned in the last election that there was an awful lot of social media that tried to do everything they could to incite, to foment racial strife. Well, this time, I don't know that they had to work that hard because they had a president that did that. Um, <laughs> and so there is a good side to the way everybody can be involved now. I mean, you get an email that tells you to bring your picket sign and go to a protest. There is a positive side to that, but there's also a negative side to it as well, because we know that white supremacists infiltrated these protests so that they could make them as disruptive and violent as possible. Now, uh, many of the protesters, especially those involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, developed a level of sophistication where they would spot the prov provocateurs and ask them to leave. But it is a problem when it is so democratic that anybody that says they're a part of Black Lives Matter, people assume there's some giant organization that is directing people to do everything. And it is an organized force, 
but it is not the level of organization, as you said, uh, mm -hmm. represented by what we had in the past. And, and Congress member, I, I just, I've got to ask you just because um, there's over 100 people watching and all wondering, you are said to be on the short list of possible candidates to fill the Senate seat soon to be vacated by Kamala Harris. Is this true? Well, I, I don't believe, you know, my poor governor, I feel sorry for him in California because he is being inundated by everyone. I don't even know if he has a list. Uh, and I do, I have seen my name floated for all sorts of jobs. I will tell you that uh, I'm very happy being Representative Raskin's colleague. And uh, for now, that's, that's where I am. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let, me go, let me go back to the elections for a, a minute. Um, Congressman Raskin, did it surprise you or were there strategic discussions within the conference um, that impeachment really didn't come up? I mean, I, I heard, a you know, we heard a lot about COVID, we heard about corruption, we heard about a lot of different issues, but it's hard to remember that in this very year, you and your colleagues actually impeached a president. Well, in Trump time, that was like 27 years ago, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it is definitely hard to remember uh, what happened. Uh, you know, but I, I attempted to call him every time I referred to him, the impeached and discredited president. And I lasted for about a few weeks uh, before I forgot, you know, uh, myself, what we've been through. I mean, this has been utterly exhausting and draining dealing with somebody of his level of uh, narcissism and mania and derangement. Um, and, you know, the truth is, I, I would have to say that both before we impeached him, but especially afterwards, he's probably engaged in somewhere between five to 10 other things that were even more impeachable than what we did impeach him for, uh, including uh, his lethal indifference to the public health in uh, COVID-19. Um, so, um, you know, what, what we've seen is just this trampling of our basic constitutional values and, and basic constitutional norms. Um, I will say uh, just a, on your last question to Congresswoman Bass, um, you know, she's, she's about the most popular and beloved person we've got. Everybody, even the Republicans love dealing with her. And that's why you see her name popping up everywhere, because um, at a time when we're looking for people who can bridge some differences and create some common ground, uh, people do look to Karen Bass. And so I would hate to lose her, but I understand why people are looking to her for leadership, including her name was floated for vice president for a long time too. Yes, I do remember that, in fact. Um, what, what's your sense, Congressman, of um, whether we're heading into um, a, a season of serious gridlock? Um, Senator uh, McConnell, even with a majority of one or two, seems to be gearing up to grind everything to a halt, including COVID relief. Well, look, you know, we've got more than 600 bills sitting on Mitch McConnell's desk right now from the 116th Congress. This is what we've been working on for the last two years. Of course, everybody's talking about the HEROES Act, um, you know, trillions of dollars of desperately needed aid for the states and the counties and the public health infrastructure and the public schools and the frontline workers and unemployed people all over the country. Um, but it goes back to the beginning, pre-COVID. I mean, we passed HR8 to have a universal background check on all violent criminals in the sale of firearms. That's supported by more than 90% of the American people, the vast majority of Democrats, Republicans, independents. They've done nothing with it, not even a hearing, because the NRA exerts that kind of stranglehold power over the GOP. HR1, we abolished gerrymandering in America and mandated the use of independent redistricting commissions. They haven't touched it. They've not done nothing with that, nothing with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, uh, which we need to end all of the voter purges and the voter suppression tactics. So we, we've got an amazing agenda on everything from climate change to prescription drugs to allow the government to negotiate for lower drug prices with big pharma in the Medicare program, a power we've got in the VA program, we've got in the Medicaid program. Um, Trump said repeatedly he wanted to do something on it, but again, nothing. Uh, we passed statehood in the House of Representatives for the District of Columbia. I mean, I could sit here all night with you. Um, mm. We've seen gridlock, right? Well, we're going from having, you know, one half of one third of the federal government, just the House, not the Senate, not the White House, not the Supreme Court, which unfortunately really is in partisan Republican hands. But at least now we're going to having 
half of the legislative branch, at least, and we might get all of it, depending on if we can win in Georgia, and the White House and the executive branch of government. So we feel like we're going to be able to get a lot more done. But of course, a lot of the legislation, yes, will still be stymied by um, Mitch McConnell if this continues to be his attitude. And I got to say that belligerence and defiance is characteristic of his attitude towards Barack Obama. You'll recall he said, I think it was the first week of Obama being in office, that his paramount overriding goal was to prevent Obama from getting anything passed that he wanted. So mm. there we go. Mm -hmm. Let me actually, let me follow up on that. Um, there, there's, um, the transition team is assembling. There's going to be a fight over what policies will get first priority. Biden has promised certain actions on day one, right? Ending the Muslim ban, I think, um, halting the child separation policy and so forth. What's a policy that's important enough out of the many you just alluded to that the administration should take up on, on day two? Um, oh, gee, you know, I, I, first of all, I think almost I can't think of a Trump executive order that should not be reversed uh, by executive order as quickly as possible in that first week. If, you know, my recommendation to Biden was to create two groups, one which is things which are just terribly destructive policy that need to be reversed. And the other is terribly destructive policy that's also completely unconstitutional because there's a lot of things that he did by executive order, like usurping the appropriations power of Congress and saying, you know, Karen and I, we voted and organized to stop his proposal for spending hundreds of billions of dollars on his stupid vanity border wall at the Mexican border, which he said the Mexican government was going to pay for. We, we voted one day to stop that. And the next day, he said he was going to reprogram money from other lawfully appropriated purposes, you know, daycare centers and military bases and, you know, housing construction and you name it. So um, basically, we got to go through all of them. But obviously, you know, one thing that's close to my heart is the dreamers. Those young people have been twisting in the wind for many years, and we've got to uh, try to undo the damage as quickly as possible and to validate their status in the country and then move forward with real comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, Congress Member Bass, what, uh, in the thicket of new legislation and policies, what do, what do you think should be a top priority? Well, I, I can't see past COVID. Uh, I believe that COVID absolutely has to be uh, the beginning. And you've seen President-elect already start, <laughs> which I think is tremendous. I think that's exactly what should happen. I do not believe in any way, shape, or form that 230 plus thousand people would have died if we had national leadership. Uh, I have been concerned along with the Hispanic Caucus, Asian Caucus, Native American Caucus about the disproportionate death rate that has happened in our communities and there needs to be a targeted intervention. And I'm sure that President-elect and Vice President Harris will develop a strategy to address that. If you think about the devastating impacts that the, the virus has had economically in our communities that have not recovered from the recession of 2010, and so when I think of, of that, I can't see past that. Now, on the other hand, foreign policy reestablishing our statute, its statute in the world is absolutely critical from the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, the Iran Agreement. I mean, there's just a number of things that needs to happen. As you mentioned, I, I chair the subcommittee on Africa, and I can't tell you how many times I have had discussions with prime ministers or presidents from African countries telling them to peacefully transfer power. If you have lost the election, concede. Uh, do everything you can to make sure that the next administration can come in. Make sure that everybody has the right to vote. We don't even have a leg to stand on from an international perspective. And one thing that I am very excited about, uh, President-elect Biden, is that he has a long history around the world. And so I know that he will be able to reestablish our presence. It has been very difficult over these last four years when people from different countries come to the Hill and say, could you please explain your foreign policy as it relates to X, Y, and Z? I mean, when he referred to the entire continent of Africa as s countries, I had to go meet with all of the ambassadors from the 50 plus countries 
in Africa. They have an office uh, in Georgetown uh, that is the home of the African Union. I asked to go speak and address the body so I can apologize on behalf of all of us. So, so much needs to be done internationally as well as domestically. The other thing that I would say is, is that you just name a federal agency, okay? President Trump picked secretaries to go in and dismantle, destroy, and, and disassemble uh, each agency. And I know that a lot of these agencies, people fled. So one of the things that I said in my discussions with the, with the vice president during that time, I said, uh, Mr. Vice President, I hope on day one, you will put out a clarion call to all of the federal agencies and ask people to come back because people have fled. You know what he said to me? He said, you know what, Karen, I don't have to, they're calling me. And so putting our government back together again is gonna be critical to be able to implement any of the policies that both Representative Raskin and I would like to see take place. Very interesting. Okay, um, I'm gonna um, take some questions now. They're in the chat and I guess in the best final tradition, I see a, a whole debate raging here in the chat. Uh, let me pull out some questions here. Um, in fact, uh, first up, um, this is from Hero um, Feingold. Thank you all so much from, from my family for honoring my father with this event. We've been working in the last few years uh, on a book tentatively titled, Is Democracy Un-American? With ideas about how to rework the election system from the ground up. Given everything that has happened in the past four years, uh, the question is, is democracy un-American? And if so, what steps can we take to, to make democracy more American? Well, well, I'll take the first shot at that. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful question. Um, and look, nothing is more American than the romantic idea of, um, you know, what uh, our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, uh, called government of the people, by the people, and for the people, right? And so uh, we have a romantic myth that makes democracy essentially American. Yes. At the same time, what we have is repeated efforts to disenfranchise people, exclude people from voting, and even in this election to suppress voter turnout and um, uh, you know, keep people outside of the democratic process. So it's a struggle, but what, you know, what I think makes democracy so American is that the motor force in our history has been the battle for inclusion, the battle for people to belong. If you look at um, every constitutional amendment we've added since the original Bill of Rights, the vast majority of them have been democracy expanding, democracy deepening and extending uh, amendments. You know, the 13th Amendment abolishes slavery, the 14th Amendment equal protection due process, 15th Amendment striking down race discrimination in voting, 17th Amendment direct election of US senators, 19th Amendment, um, you know, whose uh, centennial anniversary we observe right now, women's suffrage, 23rd Amendment, people in DC vote in presidential elections, 24th Amendment, striking out poll taxes and so on. So that is that is the American struggle. But there is the other side of it, which is the attempt to keep people out. I would love to see us do what the South Africans did in their new constitution uh, after the fall of apartheid, which is they made the right to vote, the right to be represented at every level of government, um, a formal right in the constitution. We still don't have anything like that. We've got this ragtag sequence of anti-discrimination amendments in the constitution, but we don't have a universal proclamation of everybody's right to vote and participate. And so we end up with millions of people still left out, uh, you know, millions of people in Puerto Rico who can't vote for president, um, who don't have statehood now, people in Washington, DC. We've got the only national capital on earth where the people are not represented in their own parliament. We got millions of former prisoners who had every other right restored to them when they got out of prison but not the right to vote. So I think that we've got work to do and it's not as easy as, yes, it, you know, America is democratic or it's not. It is the struggle for democracy that makes us great. Mm -hmm. a, a related question um, from uh, Deb Drucker. What are your thoughts on abolishing the electoral college? Well, you've come to the right guy because the very first bill that I introduced when I was a state senator in Maryland was to create a, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And it passed in Maryland. We now have 16 states in the District of Columbia, part of it. Uh, we have nearly 200 electoral college votes represented in it. But what this is, is a compact among states who say, 
we will cast our electors, not for the winner in our state, but for the winner of the national popular vote, once there are enough electors in the coalition to be determinative and controlling in every election. And so we've made great progress. Unfortunately, uh, the Republicans have made it a partisan thing, and that's too bad because Trump originally was very much in support of a national popular vote. After the 16 election, uh, he, you know, just discovered what he thought was the wisdom of that way of doing it. Maybe this election will make him go back to his original determination, which was, why don't we elect the president? We elect the way we elect everybody else, governors and mayors and U.S. senators, and members of Congress, whoever gets the most votes wins. You know, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars exporting democracy to other countries. We go out and we teach about democracy. One thing we never even try to teach them, or certainly nobody ever embraces, is our electoral college. It's not like there are a lot of new constitutions in Europe which say, oh, yes, and we'll use the American electoral college system. I mean, nobody's using it. It's an antique. It, is, it doesn't work. And it's, uh, you know, it's given us uh, two uh, popular vote losers in the last six or seven uh, elections. It reduces the election to a handful of states. Everybody knows what they are. Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Florida, very early. Uh, the vast majority of the country is sidelined. And then there are all these opportunities for strategic mischief and corruption, which continue to bedevil us in this election right now, as people are uncertain whether or not the GOP plans to try to get state legislatures to nullify popular election results and simply install slates of Trump electors in places where Biden's won. So mm -hmm. all of these are artifacts of the Electoral College. Let, let me just uh, add in on the democracy question, because um, I, I certainly believe, I certainly do not believe that democracy is un-American. But let me just say that we really need to come to grips with our history. I mean, even when we're talking about the Electoral College, I mean, I know everybody on this Zoom knows that the Electoral College was uh, back, dates back to the period of enslavement, and it was, it was uh, developed because of that. But when it comes to looking at making our democracy more inclusive, Representative Raskin ran through the amendments that did that, but we also know that those amendments still have not been fully implemented. So we're still struggling for the right to vote. And when I do go overseas and talk to people about that, I openly admit that we have not achieved that here. And I don't know why, but part of our American culture does not allow us to look at the weaknesses and the hypocrisy in our uh, society, and we know very little of our own history. For example, most people have no idea that the period of enslavement lasted 256 years, and for 100 years after that, we had US apartheid. And so when Representative Raskin mentioned South Africa, it reminded me of another thing that the South Africans did, which was the truth and reconciliation process where they looked at themselves. We only want to hear about George Washington's cherry tree, which wasn't even true. We don't want to hear about the 300 human beings that George Washington brutally owned and how he treated them. And so I think part of us becoming a more perfect union, a first step toward that, a first step toward our ability to address systemic racism, number one is to admit that it exists to understand our history and then to understand how to unpack it. One of the problems I have though around the electoral college and there's a lot of people interested in, in changing the electoral college and wanna organize campaigns around that is that you know it will take a change in the constitution. Well, I mean, we're still trying to get the equal rights amendment. So how's that working for us? So what I feel like we need to focus on more is making sure that we register and involve people in the electoral process. So we should focus on the fact that the emerging populations that are coming, we need to expand our electorate. And if you look at the state of Georgia, the only reason why we won in Georgia is because Stacey Abrams, after the election was stolen from her, because she should have been the governor, after it was stolen from her, she created organizations and spent years registering people to vote. And when the analysis is done on Georgia, you're gonna see that the reason why that election was won was because of the expansion of the electorate. And I think that that's a much more productive uh, struggle is to expand the electorate in each of our 50 states. And I believe that that would make a huge difference. Okay, let me ask um, one last question. Um, this is from George Evans Jones. 
Um, the 9-11 Commission makes specific reference to the negative effects of the delays in the transfer of power in 2000, uh, the uh, negative effects that uh, it had on the incoming administration's ability to build a robust national security apparatus. How dangerous is the current behavior from the Trump team, not just in democratic terms, but potentially with regards to national security? Well, I mean, I, I think, frankly, uh, this period between now and January 20th, we all should be very nervous because we don't really know what he's going to do. I mean, he's going to start firing people. He doesn't have anybody around him. And so I think that he is, is going to have a very negative impact uh, on the incoming administration. However, I wouldn't be surprised if President-elect Biden and Vice President Harris are figuring out a workaround. What I hope is going to happen is more of what we saw yesterday. When Barr said you can begin investigating, you know, for vo voter fraud, and you had a key member of DOJ quit on the spot, I am hoping that finally these folks will be willing to do that. He will leave power no matter what. And I'm hoping that they will stand up to him now. I've been very disappointed that our Republican colleagues haven't done that so far, but I am hoping that the staff will do that and will uh, abandon him. But Somebody, I mean, maybe it'll be like toward the end of the Nixon administration. You remember when he became rather stable and Secret Service had to have special procedures in place. It might, it might wind up being like that. Mm -hmm. Congressman. Yeah, the, 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 um, all of the authoritarians on earth, all of the despots and the dictators, you know, Putin and Russia and Orban in Hungary and Duterte in the Philippines and Erdogan in Turkey and uh, El Sisi in Egypt and Judah and Poland and on and on, all of them um, are very disappointed about what has taken place uh, in this election. Um, and so it is a truly dangerous moment for us in terms of our uh, national security. And we know that um, there have been uh, cyber attacks on America, not just on the electoral apparatus, but on uh, power grids, on hospitals, on universities, on big corporations and on and on. Uh, and so I think this is a very precarious, vulnerable moment for us, uh, precisely because you've got one political party that is acting really disloyal to our constitutional regime and our governmental processes. That's dangerous for us. And you know, this also is an important constitutional value embodied in the 25th Amendment. And you know, the, the, the 25th Amendment um, was all about continuity of office and stability of power. And, you know, the, the architects of it, um, Birch Bayh and Robert F. Kennedy, were writing it in the nuclear age after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And what they wanted to say was, if the president is unable to execute the powers and duties of office, then the vice president and a majority of the cabinet or the vice president and a majority of a body set up by Congress could transfer the powers to the vice president until the inability to conduct the affairs of office um, ended. Well, one of the duties of office is to commit to a transition and a peaceful transfer of power. And so if this goes on, I would say that the 25th Amendment is completely indicated without having to do any kind of medical, psychiatric, psychological diagnosis or anything. If the president is unable to commit to the transition process, which we need, then we should move, assuming the vice president is willing to cooperate to allow the vice president to make it possible to happen. But right now they are sandbagging and they are stonewalling the ability of Biden to engage in the transition. Okay, that um, brings us to the end of what has been a fascinating discussion. I wanna thank um, both members of Congress of, of, for being here and I will turn it back over to, um, I believe Dean Rich or President Boudreaux, I'm not sure. Thank you uh, very much, um, Errol Lewis. Thank you for moderating Congressman uh, Raskin, Congresswoman uh, Bass. Thank you for uh, such a thoughtful and informed discussion. Um, you know, very little that I wanna say in closing except to, to just, um, um, remind everybody, it seems to me that this, this experience and this conversation is a reminder that this is not over, that we're celebrating an election um, and, and thinking about what the election brought us, but there's a whole lot to worry about too. And for all of us, I think that means staying involved, that it's not just about voting. It's, in, it's about being active in civic life in our community and in our politics, both local and national. 
And that is not new for any of us at City College. It was Professor Feingold's call to his students for I think 40 years, it is his legacy, but it's still our call to this generation. And again, particularly here um, at City College. I, I do think there's good news. You know, Last week indicates that our democracy works up to a point. We voted, we voted in record numbers. There's an outcome. The election seemed to have been clean despite extraordinary circumstances. There are those who are sowing doubt, but you know, I think we expect a transition in January and that's the sign of a somewhat functioning democracy so that there is reason um, to hope. Uh, I, I would say that reason to hope will, will remain with you for however long you can stay off Twitter. Um, so uh, thank you all for being with us today. I particularly wanna thank the group of students that Professor Feingold had who um, made this whole event possible. Anita Altman, Paul Bergman, Judy Wood, um, Sid Davidoff, Ron Goldbrenner, Malcolm Lewin. Special thanks to Fumiko Feingold for being with us today. Again, thanks to our speakers. Have a great evening and thanks.